John chapter 14. And our message tonight and tomorrow will be different messages, but they'll flow together. Tonight I want to share on overcoming the orphan spirit or overcoming an orphan heart. And I want to talk about the orphan spirit, about a way of thinking, a way of living your life, even if you become a Christian, that creates so much stress and pressure. And what causes this and what people behave like when this is motivating them and, and then how to break free of it. And then tomorrow I want to talk about experiencing the love of the Father. You know, when Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, his prayer was that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Not duty or obligation or law or compulsion or pressure, but rooted and grounded in love. See? And Jesus' prayer, uh, wonderful prayer, his last words he recorded in, pray, in praying, and very simply this, he prayed that the love that the Father had for him would be in us. That's an amazing prayer. So I'll touch into that tomorrow. I want to share some things about knowing what God is like, revelation of the Father. And if we have no revelation, we can't build relationship. So many are stuck because your thinking about God is stuck. And when our, our thinking is stuck, we can't build deep intimacy. So in, in our journey, I have hungered continually to know God in a deeper way. Amen. Let's have a look then in the Bible. I want to just talk a little bit about the orphan spirit. So we'll start off with a passage. And uh, as Jesus is talking to his disciples, and uh, he said, uh, verse 16 of John chapter 14, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another comforter, one who will come alongside to strengthen, support, and help another comforter. In other words, he's saying, I have been here with you as a comforter, as a spiritual father to you. But he said, uh, when I leave, and I'm leaving, about to leave, he said, I will pray the Father, he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. In other words, he's saying that once you've received this comforter, once you've received the Holy Spirit, he will never leave you. And uh, we're going to get to that in a moment when we come to deal with the orphan spirit. And he said, even the spirit of truth, the world can't receive him. It doesn't see him or know him, but you know him. He dwells with you. So their experience of the Holy Spirit was they were in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He was moving in the life of Jesus, through the life of Jesus. And now Jesus said, that same spirit that's within me, the spirit of sonship, is going to be within you. And he said, he dwells with you, and soon he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Notice the statement, I will not abandon you and leave you as a spiritual orphan. I will not leave you orphaned. Now, let's just talk a little bit about orphans. I want to share a little bit of Bible perspective related to this. Uh, in the Bible, the word orphan uh, really, or firstly, when we think of an orphan, we think of someone who's got no parents at all. But from the Bible perspective, an orphan was someone who was without a father. They may still have had a mother, but they're still considered an orphan if there was no father. Why did they consider them an orphan or fatherless? Because of the role of a father, a father's role. A father, first of all, the word means to be a source. The Father is the source of identity. Father is a source of DNA. Father is a source uh, of uh, provision. A Father is a source of protection. A Father is a, a source of guidance. So all of these things are what God is like as a Father. He is a source to us. So in the Bible uh, uh, culture, if you had no Father, then you were very vulnerable. If you had no Father, there's no one to protect you, guide you, discipline you, uh, stand with you, empower how are you to go forward in life? There's no one to do that. You're on your own and you're very vulnerable. So the most exploited people were the widows and the orphans. And all through the Bible, God speaks about his heart for the fatherless. God's heart is for those without a father because of the unique role that a father has. Now, of course, in the, in the last 20, 30 years, the role of fatherhood has been greatly diminished to the point now where now people are struggling majorly over gender and gender issues. Now that's just a fruit. The root is the lack of fatherhood. 
and the problem of a father. Now, I want to just talk about fathers and sons in the Bible, and then we're going to talk about the orphan spirit. When we think in terms of uh, fathers and sons or fathers and daughters, uh, the way we have a thinking is not the same as the Bible considers it. The word son in the Bible means literally this. A son means to be a builder of the father's house. So the father, a, a son, had three roles. Number one, his first role, as is our first role, was relationship with his father. So you and I, firstly, are called to intimacy with God as a father and ongoing revelation of what he is like intimacy with the Father. This was foundational to Jesus' ministry. He said, this is what eternal life is, that they know you, that they have intimate relationship with you. So eternal life is not something you have. Eternal life is a relational connection from which you draw life. It's a relationship with God as Father. The second thing that a, that a son was required to do, a son was required to be the Father's representative. Only a son can represent a father because the son, and I mean daughter as well, only a son or a daughter can represent their father because they carry DNA. They have the father's DNA. They have his characteristics. So in the Bible, a son was called not just to relationship with his father, but also to be the father's representative. That meant he spoke and acted in his father's name. He stood in place of his father uh, and acted and spoke for the Father. So how can you represent God if you don't know what God is like? You can only represent God accurately to the degree you have revelation of him. So intimacy, intimacy and knowing what and being able to represent God go hand in hand. That's why the Bible tells us that God's ongoing plan is to conform you or change you or transform you to become ex like Jesus Christ himself, who is the express image of the Father. Or putting it simply, God is working in your life to heal the wounded and broken and dysfunctional parts. It's a lifelong process and the goal is to transform you so you more accurately represent what God is like. This is the problem. We, we live by rules. We live by all kinds of obligations instead of living by relationship whereby I represent what God is like in how I do life and treat people. Then the third thing a son is required. A son, of course, is the builder of the father's house. So a son always had an assignment from his father. Every son had an assignment from his father. An assignment is a work you were called to do. So when Jesus came into the earth, he said that the father has sent me or given me an assignment. As the father sent me, now I send you. So every son really has got these three things working in their life. Number one, relationship with the father. Number two, representing the father. Therefore, I need to be transformed and grow more like him. And three, my mission, my assignment, what the father has called me to do. Now, you're, you need to have all three things in balance, all three things working all the time. Intimacy with the Father empowers you for assignment. Intimacy with the Father reveals the lacks in your life and leads to transformation. Transformation improves the quality of function in your assignment. All three things go together. So now I've just given you a bit of an overview. That's what sonship looks like. And so when you look at the life of Jesus, you'll find all things, three things were operating in him. Number one, there was intimacy with the Father. Number two, there was a representation of the Father. That's why I could say things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Here's a good question. When people see you, do they see the Father? Do they feel his love? Do they feel his compassion? Do people get a revelation of what God is like because you carry his presence and you demonstrate his character? And thirdly, Jesus said, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free. In other words, Jesus said, I'm anointed to fulfill a specific assignment. So if you start to look again in the gospels, you'll find sonship involves those three things all the time working together. So of course, if you have no father, then you have no source to draw from. 
you have to find life for yourself. If you have no father, there's no one to represent. You just represent and act on your own behalf and your own interests. If you have no father, then there's no sense of purpose or a unique assignment you're responsible to fulfill. Your life then is about you trying to struggle and fill the emptiness that lies inside. So that's the problem or the challenge that people have when they're orphaned. So an orphan in the Bible was a disastrous situation socially and financially. Every aspect of it was like that. So when we're born into this world, we're born spiritual orphans. In other words, we enter the world, we're separated from God our Father, so a part of us is empty. A part of us is lacking relationship with God. A part of us doesn't really know who we are and where we've come from. We don't know our identity fully. And a part of us is struggling to know what our purpose is because all of those things come from our Father. And so when you don't know those things, then you're going to try and find substitutes. So let me just talk a little bit. And I want to identify for you, uh, firstly, what causes people to feel or to experience an orphan heart. Now, uh, when I say orphan spirit, I'm not talking just about demons. Although people who have an orphan heart will have demons around their life. They'll be motivated by the agreement they have with certain spirits. But uh, an orphan heart really is someone who has been abandoned. When a child is given up by the parents, then they are orphaned. When a child is rejected by a father or mother, they are literally orphaned emotionally. When a, when a child is abused by a father or mother, then they experience the deep pain of separation, disconnection, and a deep loneliness. The problem that empowers or drives an orphan is, I am on my own. That's the major mindset they have. I'm on my own, there's no one standing with me. And this is, this is to be found everywhere. But it can be greatly magnified by the home situation we have. So what happens when a person has been orphaned through uh, literally a family breakup, a divorce, being unwanted? All of those kinds of things create emotional pain in people's lives which they struggle to find res get a resolution from, and it leads to a sense of a deep wounding. And when people are wounded, they come to conclusions. There's no one here for me. I'm on my own. There's no one to help me, no one to provide for me. I've got to provide for myself. No one to protect me. I need to stand up for myself. No one to promote me. I need to promote myself. So you understand that the orphan heart or mentality or spirit, it's a whole paradigm of looking at life. And when we get born again, God's desire is to set us free from being an orphan and to become part of a family with him as father where our whole internal wiring, our thinking, our motivations all come out of being connected back to the source again. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that, and uh, I want to help you uh, see what this looks like. So what are some of the traits of an orphan heart, an orphan mentality, a person who's wounded inside? Now, they may be a Christian, they may be in church, but you can be in church and still be deeply orphaned and struggling with deep loneliness. One of the problems of this age is loneliness. I haven't been anywhere where people aren't struggling with loneliness. Even though there's so much connection on the, on the social media, the connection is artificial for the most part. It doesn't really bring you the face-to-face -face connection where you feel and sense where someone is at. People still want that, still need that. You get any idea? So let me give you some of the traits of a person who's motivated by an orphan heart, orphan spirit, orphan mentality. Here's what it looks like. Number one, they're highly competitive usually highly competitive with others to try and make their name or gain a position of recognition or some kind of approval. So a person who struggles with an orphan heart, struggles with rejection and abandonment, will strive and compete to prove they're good enough, to prove they're worthwhile. 
And I see that everywhere. I see it even among successful businessmen. I remember being with a businessman and I, uh, I discovered that he was incredibly successful, had more than 100 businesses of a certain kind of business. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. 100 businesses? How does anyone have 100 businesses? And, and then I listened to his story where he came from and he had been emotionally orphaned at about the age of 12 and had never gotten over it and was motivated by the pain striving to get something to fix the pain in his heart. But I said, well, how many, rest, how, many, how many businesses are going to be enough? How many will be enough before you come to peace and rest in your heart? And he couldn't answer. I said, there's no answer to that one because no matter how much you struggle to produce more business and more wealth and whatever, it's not gonna resolve the pain you have, which is a spiritual pain and emotional pain in the heart. Here's the second thing I've noticed of people that are, that are struggling with an orphan spirit. They're very jealous of the success of others. In other words, they're always comparing. You find people that struggle with that orphan heart will compare themselves with other people. If they're a pastor, they compare with other churches. Cell group leader, they compare with other cell group leaders. This thing's, it appears everywhere. Unfavorable comparison. People looking at someone else and then competing with them to try and be better than them. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's something that's driven from inside. Now, I'm all in for competition of various kinds, but when it's, a, when it's driven by an emotional rejection or spiritual rejection in the heart, when it's driven and empowered by demons, it, nothing you can do is going to fix that pain. It's going to keep operating. Okay, so uh, then another thing I notice is that uh, usually uh, the person who's struggling like this builds their identity around things external, around possessions, what I own. Look what I own. I've just got the latest iPhone. Look at this. I've got the latest vehicle. Look at this. I've got this. I've got this. I've got this. It's around things or it's around how I look, what I dress like. It's all around appearance. I'm not saying that you don't have things or don't have a, a, a sharp appearance, not at all. But when there's a drive of rejection and abandonment in a person's heart, that becomes everything to them. It becomes a driven thing. There's no rest, no peace. They're worried about success. They're worried about achievement. In fact, they're driven so fiercely that no matter what they achieve, they're still never happy. I remember struggling with this immensely growing up because my father had lost his father. He had gone away to a war, and he'd come back emotionally broken and struggling to survive, to provide for a family and to build a stable family. And so uh, he was quite a perfectionist, so he was very detailed, and it seemed like nothing I did was ever good enough. Even if I got really, I used to get as high as about third or fourth in the class every time. It was never quite enough. And so the message I learn is no matter what I do, it's never enough. So that produces a striving to try and achieve, and always the message is never enough. So even after he's gone, still in my head is ringing, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough, it's not good enough. You understand, these are spiritual and emotional bondages that we need freedom from. They are the consequence of lack of intimacy with Father and coming to rest in his provision and receiving his affirmation and love. That's why we're gonna talk about that more tomorrow. Here's another sign that someone's got, a, got a, um, an orphan uh, spirit, orphan mentality, is when they serve, it's always with an agenda for recognition. So if you have a serving role in the church and you haven't been healed in this area, then it'll always be about gaining recognition by people. It'll always be about how can I be promoted, how can I look good, and so you want to tell everything good and hide things that are not so good. It, it's about struggling inside, trying to fill an ache that only God can fill. A person who uh, is in such a leadership role, one of the sad things is this, and I've observed this over many years, if they are broken and damaged and this is not healed, then their serving is not out of love, it's out of getting something. Now you understand, if I love you, I serve you with no strings attached. What I give is a gift to you, how you respond is up to you. But if I have a need for approval, affirmation, if I'm driven by an orphan heart, then I will use you to build my identity and esteem as a leader. So I will use you to build what I want. So relationships are never authentic, 
they're always about using people, they're transactional, they're about using people to get myself ahead. And then once I've used you to get where I can, then some, and you can't help me anymore, I'll drop you and now I'll go to someone else who can. Now, this is not the kingdom of God. This is another spirit. This is the spirit of the world. This is the thing Jesus said. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I won't leave you like that. I, I've got a remedy for you, and it's going to solve this problem completely. It's the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost. You get the Holy Ghost. People just think, I don't know why people don't love him more. Here's the answer to these things. Man, we need the Holy Ghost. Need the power of the Holy Ghost. Here's another thing. That if people have an orphan spirit. They, if they don't get their way, they, they throw a hissy fit. They start to get angry and upset and pouty or depressed. They didn't get their way. They start to manipulate people. You understand? These are some of the symptoms. Here's another symptom of someone having an orphan heart. They constant struggle with loneliness. Even if they're busy, busy lives, they're still lonely. It's an inward emptiness that comes about or is filled only by a vital connection with God. You can be alone, but not lonely. You can be in the middle of a crowd, but really lonely. I've been there in that place, in church as well as in the world. Another trait that orphans have is constant fear and anxiety. What if this, what if that, what if that? And so because of fear, they then move to control their emotions, what they're doing, so no one gets to see what they're like. And they, they try to control the people around them and the relationships so they feel safe. You understand? Because they're driven not by love, which brings peace to the relationship, they're driven by fear. How many of you know someone like that? How many of you have got someone who's got one of those things? Yeah, not going to own up, eh? <laughs> well, here's the last one that I thought of, and that is that when people struggle with an orphan spirit, they're desperate to get people's approval. They become people pleasers. So they don't set proper boundaries. They don't know when to say no or how to hold their no. They just give in to whatever is demanded of them. So that can be a parent, can be like that. So these are, this is what are the orphan traits. Now, here's the thing. When a person is struggling with those things, how do they cope with it? What do people do to deal with the pain? Well, there's only one answer to the pain, and the answer to the pain is that the Holy Spirit enters our life, fills the gap in the center, and that he brings healing to the parts of our life where we're damaged and hurting, in pain, and are angry because of what's happened to us. And it can happen in family, it can happen at school, it can happen uh, in the workplace, it can happen in church. There is no exception. While we're in this world, we're going to have tribulation, pressures, difficulties, challenges, setbacks. And some of those things happen in church. You, you've got to actually be committed to God's process of becoming a mature son and daughter, of growing up, of letting, first of all, his spirit enter your life to break the cycle or the power of the root source of being an orphan, and secondly, to let him bring healing to your soul so you grow in the capacity to love, grow in the capacity to stand up in who you are, fulfill your assignment, and be a great representative of the Father. When, you, when you've broken out of being an orphan and become a son, a child of the living God, you've broken free of slavery, you're now in a place where actually what people do is not what determines what you do. I am generous because this is who I am. I'm a child of my father. I am a giver. Why? Because I'm a child of my father who's a giver. I'm a forgiver. I forgive people. I walk in forgiveness. Why? Not because people deserve it. That's who I am. You understand, when your identity becomes established and the orphan thing is broken over your life, then now you live differently. You serve, well, people don't recognize you. It doesn't matter. My father's always watching. You understand? You're not, you're not serving as a man pleaser because now my father's watching everything. I don't have to promote myself. Look at me, look at me. I don't have to do any of that. Why? Because my father's watching and my father can give me the breakthroughs. My father can promote me. He wants to promote me. He's committed to my promotion, but he wants me to grow in character so I become more like him. So you understand that the remedy for the orphan spirit is the spirit of sonship, to actually embrace the Holy Spirit to embrace who I have become when I receive Christ and to let the Holy Spirit heal those broken, shattered, old things that are in my life. It's a journey. 
Let me tell you a secret. It's a lifelong journey. You don't just sort of come up and hold a cue, or get someone to pray for me, give me a quick fix, give me a quick deliverance, there it is. No, 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 no. This is about your journey of transformation. And, and no matter what level you are, you're gonna just face new challenges which bring up what's in your heart and bring it to a place where you could process it, be healed, and grow again. So it won't matter what level you are, whether you're a new believer in the church, whether you're a soul group leader, a zone group leader, whether you're one of the pastors on staff or the senior pastor, everyone is gonna face their challenges. Why? Because God wants to show He is your source. He is the one who gives you the breakthrough. He is the one you can lean on. You're not alone. You're not alone. God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm always with you. I'm never gonna let you go. I love you. You're my child. I'm pleased with you. That's the voice that should be talking to us. Are you listening to that voice? Is there another voice talking to you? So the problem when people have these things is instead of turning to the Holy Ghost, turning to our Father in heaven, we look for other things. Let me give you a few things that people look for. People try and fill the void, and they try and find approval and recognition and a feeling of peace because it's the lack of peace is the problem. See, God's kingdom, or when, when, when God rules and His order is established, one of the evidence of it is peace. You become a peaceful person. And joy the Holy Ghost gives. I see a lot of sad, depressed people. Well, they can't be living in kingdom reality. They're living like an orphan still, like God doesn't care, like I'm on my own, like I'm struggling, like I'm overwhelmed, like I don't have enough. Instead of living, thankful to the Father for his provision and learning how to enjoy and walk with him and being at rest in it. Oh, that gets, I see people get quiet when it comes in a bit close like that. <laughs> okay, let me tell you what people turn to. Number one, passions. Uh, they all start with a P, so it's easy to remember. Passions. So what do we turn? We turn to things that help us feel good. Oh, food. I love coming to Singapore. The food. Oh. See, you can, but you can end up eating to comfort all the pain or can turn to alcohol or drugs. Or another one, people turn to, 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 to fantasy. It turned into games. They get out. Remember, we had one session here. and We had, a, had a, a ministry call for people addicted to games. We had about 200 Bible school students come up and get delivered to demons. <laughs> see, see, you understand, nothing wrong with the games. It's just that they can draw you into a realm of fantasy where you live in another world instead of facing reality where you substitute the presence and reality of God for some fantasy or something that someone else dreamed up. So, so, so um, passions, possessions, people turn to possessions to try and fill the need. They look for security and things. Now listen, if you find your security and identity in something outside you, you are inherently unstable. If your security is in your position, when the position is taken away, then you will fall apart and feel hurt in your heart. If, if your, uh, your, your, uh, your identity is found in people and they're approving of you, when they turn on you and criticize you, you'll be devastated in your heart. So you understand, if your identity is in anything outside you, you become unstable. We are to be rooted and grounded in the love God has for me, not in things external to us. People just don't get it. They really struggle with it. And I've seen that because I remember when I, I, I led a school, when God called me to let it go and do something else, people couldn't understand that. When I led a movement of churches in New Zealand, and it came to a time when the Lord said, that's it, I'm finished with that, it's time for you to move into this now. When I let it go, people couldn't understand I would let it go. Why would you do that? I said, because my assignment finished. That's it. When God spoke me, woke me up one day and spoke to me about changing leadership in our church, that was it. On that day, I met with the Lord, grieved over the transition, and wept and wept and wept, got a new commission from the Lord, then it was a matter of working it out. People say, how can you do that? Say, so simply, my assignment finished. You understand, if you live as a son, you live out of intimacy for the Father, you live out of a desire to be changed and grow, and you live out of my assignment. I live in my assignment. So if it's not my assignment, I shouldn't be doing it. 
because it'll bring burden and pressure and stress and anxiety and lack of resources. I'll have all the problems everyone else has. But if I live in my assignment, there's a joy, there's a peace, and there's the presence of God in it. Are you doing what God called you to do? See, doesn't, God doesn't tell us to do everything. Jesus didn't do everything. He said, I do the things I see my father doing. In other words, he discovered that I just need to discover what my father wants and be doing that. Not doing everything. But you've got to have quite strength of your relationship with God to be able to do that. So people turn to passions, possessions. They turn to performing. They try to prove that they're good enough. And then pressure comes on, the whole culture of the world. If you perform, then you get approval. But what if I got my approval without that anyway? Now I can rest in the performance and just do the best I can and honor God with it. You understand, it, it, it's just when you can find a center in the Lord, the power of this orphan spirit that drives the world and culture breaks off your life because you're running from something different. People turn to people, they look for relationships, they turn to position, they look for a role, a position. I've seen it, I've seen it over years. I've seen people who are broken in the world come into the church, now they're looking for a position in the church. This is my new beginning. And once they're in that position, they become awful people because they're not in it for love and for serving, they're in it because I want this to give me a sense of value and importance. I think, oh, what happened to you being so, so important? Jesus said, this is what kingdom leadership looks like. You stand up and you lead and then you get down and you wash feet and serve people. But you see, if you've got an orphan mentality, you like the leadership bit, but not the serving bit. Oh, he got real quiet suddenly. <laughs> Felt the atmosphere sucked out. <laughs> but you got, we got a real, this is, this is kingdom. This is what Jesus said. In the world, everyone wants position, recognition, and they want to rule over people, boss them around. He said, it shall not be so among you. You want to be great? I'm all into you being great. But there's a way to become great, and that way is the way of serving and loving people. And if you want to be the greatest of all, oh, take on more responsibility. Be the servant of all. See, that's, that's what the kingdom looks like. That's what sonship looks like. That's what revealing our Father looks like. Jesus said, you can look in the, look, you can look in the whole Bible and you can see insights to God, but if you want to see what he's really like, look at Jesus. He said, you've seen me, you've seen him. Watch how I deal with people. Watch how I treat people. Watch how I relate to people. Watch how I address issues. Watch how I live my life. This is what Father is like. He came to give us a physical example. People are still looking for an example of what God is like. They want you to become a son, you to become a daughter, you to grow up and to show us what God is like. Instead of just coming to church and then copying the world the rest of the week. We're called to be sons and daughters. That's who we're called to be. Say amen to that. So there's some things. Okay, so let's, just, let's have a look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. That is what Jesus made. He made a promise. I won't leave you orphaned. In other words, his leaving orphaned them. But he said, I won't leave you like that. What do you mean his leaving orphaned them? Because he was a spiritual father to them. If you look at Jesus' relationship with the disciples, you realize he was a spiritual father to them. Now, they all had natural fathers, and some of them perhaps were great fathers. Some of them were not great fathers. But they now had a new father and then when the father said, I'm about to leave you, they freaked out. And so he says, I'm not going to orphan you. I'm going to send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. Now, this one is exactly the same as me. He's identical to me. We have the same values. He's been with me. He's, he's the spirit of my father. He's the one who's helped me know my sonship. And I'm going to put, give you that spirit, put that spirit in you. Look, can you find it in Romans chapter 8? You'll see it there. Romans chapter 8. And it says here in verse, uh, uh, read verse 14 uh, through to verse 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. It doesn't say as many as come to church. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. That's what sonship looks like. The ones who are sons of God are led by the Holy Spirit. 
That doesn't mean you don't make your plans. It doesn't mean you set goals and, and whatever, but it means in all of it, you are yielded or surrendered to let someone else be at the wheel of your life. You're led by the Holy Spirit. He guides you. What does he guide you into? Into the fruit of the Spirit, into the purpose of the Father. He guides you into all things. He will reveal things to come. He'll show you things you don't know. So it says here, uh, it says, those are the sons of God. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father, and the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, we're children of God, and of children we are heirs of Christ, and joint heirs if we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. Now the lot in there, I won't give it all, I just want to focus on the adoption part, or the sonship part in there. Notice there, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. What is the spirit of bondage? It is a demonic spirit that causes people to be tormented and restricted and live imprisoned. And what is it? It's a spirit which causes us to believe we are rejected or abandoned. And it causes us to fear. What kind of fear? To fear, if I'm not good enough, I'll be rejected. If I'm not good enough, people will leave me. If I'm not good enough, I will be abandoned by people. And that bondage drives people everywhere, drives them crazy. He said, you have not received the spirit of bondage to fear. God does not want you to live in fear. Fear of failure, fear of being rejected, fear of not being good enough, fear of missing the mark. We're not to be driven by fear. He says, rather, he says, I've given you the Holy Ghost. I put the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, I put that Spirit in you, and that Spirit inside you will bear witness with your Spirit to your identity. God puts a Spirit in you and says, that is a new creation. Why is it a new creation? Because before you were a human being with a spirit that's disconnected from God. You were a human being. You were a fallen creation. But when God puts his spirit in you and his spirit is joined to you, now you are a new creation. You are different. You're not that kind of person that's unsaved. You're this kind of person, a new creation man. You're a child of the living God. You are completely different. The old finished, there's a new man, and he's part God, part man. His Spirit of God is joined to your spirit. Now you are a new person. You are God connected to man, which is what God always wanted from the beginning. But the problem is we still think the old ways and we still carry the old wounds. So God puts his spirit in and the Spirit of God in you is to help you discover and confirm who you are. Who are you? You're not what you do. You're who God says you are. Who are you? You're not what people think about you or say about you. That is not who you are. You're what God says about you. Who are you? You're not what you own. What you own are just possessions to enjoy. If God says, I want you to give them up, give them up. That's not who you are. You're a child of God. When it came to the building program, God spoke to us and said, give up your boat. He said, oh, I like that boat. He said, no, give it up. I want you to sow it into City Harvest. No, fine, it's not my boat. I've got a beautiful gold ring here. I kind of like this gold ring. It's got a, it's got a, it's a gold sovereign, actually, and on it, it's got a picture of St. George slaying the dragon. It's a great reminder. I'm called to be a dragon slayer. But I was uh, at a pastor's ordination, a young man, great young man, and uh, while we're just going through the process of ordaining him, God said, give him your ring. And I think, I wonder if that's God or not. <laughs> and I just, held, I just stood there on the stage for a little bit. And, and as I'm standing there, I began to suddenly realize all the dimensions of what the ring meant. The gold, the dragon, the, the, the knight, the, the, the warfare, and so on. So I started to realize all that. And then, and then the Lord just spoke to me again. He said, what are you doing with that ring? It isn't yours. I said, you're right, I better get it off quick, it belongs. He said, it doesn't belong to you. I've just given it to someone else. Catch up with the program. And I, I took it off, gave it to the young man, said what it signified, and it just touched him. The Holy Ghost came on him, 
and I release the anointing of deliverance on his life, pray to impart that this whole thing of slaying dragon, this the ministry of deliverance, the ministry of Jesus would come on his life. You understand? But it was just, this is not who I am. It just happens to be something I have. But if God says it goes, it goes. And you understand? You are not what you own. You are who God says you are. See? You are who God says you are. All the time you are. See? See? You've received the spirit of adoption, the, the spirit that places you into sonship and enables you to say, Daddy, which is an intimate term, I've got a father who loves me and I can just run to him anytime. He cares about me. I can come to him. So the spirit of an orphan or the orphan heart is broken by the revelation that God is your father. He loves you. His spirit is in you. You're never alone. Never alone. Never alone. Never alone. Never without support. Never without a comforter. Never without encouragement. Never without someone to guide you. Never without someone to lead you. The problem is we're still thinking in the old way. How we need to realize the Holy Ghost is inside us and then he puts his spirit on us to give us power to serve and to minister. How you need that. If you know you have an assignment, it's a supernatural thing. You can't do it without the power of the Holy Ghost. So notice you didn't receive. So when we're in the world, we receive another spirit, demonic spirits. What kind of spirits? Rejection. You listen to words that come into your head. Listen, if you have thoughts come into your mind, those thoughts, someone spoke them. So if God didn't speak them, who is speaking them to you? Those thoughts that say, I'm not good enough. Where do they come from? Oh, that's a demon you're listening to that's ministering to you. Or or thoughts of nobody likes me. Oh, that's a demon. God doesn't say that. Or I'll never be good enough. Oh, that's not God, that's a demon too. And a lot of people are letting demons minister to them. They're in agreement with demonic thoughts because they're still hurting with the pain of being rejected, abandoned, abused, in some kind of way mistreated. And they've never let God into the pain to heal them. And so that opens them up to voices coming, opens them up to demons pushing in on their mind. Then it says, come on, you need to do this, you need to do that. And next thing you know, you're addicted to all kinds of stuff. And we come to church and lift our hands up, but it doesn't last because we're still in agreement with these thoughts. And you walk out the door and suddenly they hit you again and all the joy that was there is gone because you're letting a demon influence your thoughts. And the reason it can influence your thoughts is because you're listening to it. And why are you listening to it? Because of the pain in your heart. This is familiar to you. Self-pity can be familiar to you. Loneliness can be familiar. Fear can be familiar. Rejection can be familiar. All these things we talk about, they can be familiar to you because you've been listening to them for so long you think it's you. It is not you. The voice of your father says things like this. You're my son that I love. I delight in. I think about you. The thoughts I have to you are thoughts for peace, not evil, that you might have a future you look forward to. Do you understand? When we're listening to God's voice, it will minister to us differently to the voice of demons. And many people sadly listen to those other voices and then they live and they struggle. We struggle. And sometimes we we try to save ourselves. We try to fix it up. We try to control the pain, and we control the pain by building walls in our heart. We say, well, I'll never let anyone hurt me again. I'll never trust anyone again. I'll never trust a leader again. I'll never trust any person over me again. The problem is when you do that, you shut down the ability of anyone God sends to you to help you because you won't trust them, because you're harboring hurt. Or we say, uh, you know, I'll never trust any man Well, how are you ever going to build a marriage if you never trust a man? It's not going to happen. The wall you put up to protect yourself now creates massive cycles of failure in relationships in that area. Or, well, I'll never trust a woman. I'll never let any woman hurt me again. All of those kind of statements are are statements we make to protect ourselves from being hurt again rather than saying, Father, I've been hurt. I bring you into the pain. I bring the pain to the cross where Jesus took the trauma and the sorrow and the grief. 
I let go forgiveness and forgive because you have forgiven me. I bless them because you say to bless those who curse you. And pray for those who despitefully use you. Father, I, I am a child of the living God. This is what I do. You understand? Your whole way of thinking is completely different. You have not received the spirit of bondage, but you have received something else. Now, here's the thing. The key to breaking out is to receive from God. It's not trying harder. You've already done that. It's not trying to please everyone. You've tried that too. It's not buying something new. You tried that and then it got old. You needed the latest one. It's none of those things work. What we need to do is submit to receiving what God has for us and abandon the things we've held on to. So that means I've got to come to the Lord and be honest with him and say, God, I'm in pain and I've actually done things that keep the pain going and I behave in a way that doesn't represent you. Lord, I bring the pain to you. Take it out of my heart. Lord, I release forgiveness to those who hurt me. I repent of making an idol out of this instead of turning to you to meet my need. You understand? This is quite an altar you build before the Lord. And I've had to do it many times at different levels and different layers. And it always has the same things. It always means to recognize that God loves me deeply and to admit that I'm in pain and let him have the pain. It always means to forgive. It always means to repent, to let go the things I've attached to, either to protect myself or to make myself feel good. And it always involves meditating in the goodness of our Father. You understand, tomorrow I'll share with you more about how to do that. But today I want to help you get free of that orphan pain. That driving pain of loneliness, of abandonment, of rejection, that driving pain of addiction, all of those things, God doesn't want you to be bound that way. That's why Jesus came. He said, I want to show you what the Father's like. See that woman there who's broken down and in adultery? You watch me come and heal and restore her. See that lady there? She's had all these husbands and they all gave up on her and abandoned her and she's broken and she's in shame. You watch how I lift the shame off her life and bring revelation to her. Uh, and there's a man who's a leper that everyone's rejected him. No one got near me. You watch how I'm not afraid of that and I'll come there and I'll touch him and lift him up and heal him and restore him. You see, that's what our Father's like. Tomorrow I'll share something of a revelation of the Father, what he's like. And it just when I saw it, I just began to weep and weep. I thought, why did I never see that before? So I want to give you a challenge. First, two, two altar calls, two opportunities. Here's the first one. Number one, if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ, you've never opened your life to the love of God, to the goodness of God, God knows you're separated from him. He knows you are born into this world with an emptiness spiritually. He knows that you've been just making your way through life, trying to do the best you can, but inside you're still empty and you need the Spirit of God. You need to be connected to your Father. That's what's called being born again. What means born again? Born from above. The Spirit of God comes into my life and my spirit comes alive. My sins are forgiven. I become a new person. I want to give you that honor, that privilege. You don't have to remain a spiritual orphan. You don't have to remain alone. You don't have to remain separated from God. You don't have to follow the crowd living the same way under the same pressures. You could get a new start in a moment. And that start comes when you recognize your need and recognize Jesus came to restore you to the Father. He said, the Spirit is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel. That means to let you know the good news, you can be reconciled back to your Father in heaven and have a relationship with Him. And how do I do that? You say, how do I do that? How can that happen? Very simple, Jesus said, to everyone who received Him. What, don't you mean I've got to, I have to do something? No, no, to everyone who received Him, who believed on His name, believed on who He is. Jesus means to save you. It means the one, the Son, the Father sent to save you, to heal you, to restore you. If you receive Him, He gives you the privilege to become a son, a daughter. God is my Father. Why don't we close our eyes? <coughs> Just close our eyes. Holy Spirit, come. There's many of you sitting here today 
and you recognize that emptiness, loneliness, the ache in your heart. God is reaching out to you. He wants you to know I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning you. I want you to know I love you. Would you open your heart and give me access? I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open up, I will come in. Are you ready to do that today? What's stopping you? Fear of people? Oh, that's that old orphan thing again. Fear of change? Oh, that's that old orphan again. Fear I'll lose something? No, that's that old orphan thing again. If God so loved you, he gave Jesus Christ to die on the cross. He, how much more will he give you everything you need? He is generous. God is not a taker. But he wants you to yield, to surrender, to stop trying to go it alone and come to him. Would you do that today? I want you to do this. Raise your hand. If you're ready to receive Jesus Christ, God bless you. The hand up over here. Just put your hand up clearly so I can see. Put hands up, wanting to receive Jesus. Every hand up. Just put your hand up wherever you are. God bless. God bless. Anyone else? God bless. Hands over there. Anyone else? Hands over there. God bless. Anyone else? Just raise your hand. I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive his presence. I want to receive the spirit of God into my life. I want to break that orphan loneliness in my life. Is that you? Why don't you raise your hand? Anyone else? Raise your hand. Raise your, I see a hand over there. Hand over there. God bless. God bless. So many people wanting to receive Jesus. This is what we're going to do. I want to have an opportunity to pray with you and to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus. So in a moment, we'll all stand to our feet. We're all going to clap and encourage you. I'd like you to make your way down the front. This is an exciting thing when someone stops being an orphan and comes into the family of God. The Bible says heaven rejoices, and we want to rejoice as well. Church, let's stand together, and let's welcome people coming to give their lives to Jesus. Would you make your way to the front right now? Please come, please come, please come, please come. Please come. People wanting to receive Jesus, please make your way to the front. Come right to the front right now. Friends, encourage your friends to come. Encourage your friends to come. Encourage, if you brought a friend, ask them if they'd like to come. You'll come down with them. Come on, church, let's clap. There's people coming to the Lord today. People coming to Jesus. People coming to Him. People coming to Him. People are coming to Him. Church. Come on, church, keep clapping. There's others who are wanting to come as well. Would you come? Would you come? Would you come? Would you come? Some are weeping. They're being touched by the presence of God. Would you come? Would you come? Come now. People are still coming. Church, keep clapping. Right up the back there. People still coming. People still coming. That's right. Make your way forward. Bring your friends forward to receive Jesus. Bring your friends forward to receive Jesus. Come on, church. People are still coming. People are still coming. Let's give them a clap. Let's celebrate. This is such a wonderful thing. People coming to Jesus. It's such a wonderful thing. Come, let's right. Come, 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 come. Come, come. Come, there's still time to come. That's right, people are still coming. People are still making their way down. People are still coming from over here. Giving their lives to Jesus. How wonderful, how wonderful, how wonderful. God loves each one of you. You are precious to Him. How exciting. I just want to look at you all for a moment. Every one of you, God knows all of your names. He knows your name. He knows what's happening in your life. He knows what you struggle with. He knows what's happening in your family. He knows what's been happening in your life, and He loves you deeply. He loves you deeply. He knows the shame you carry, and He loves you deeply. He knows the ache you have in your heart, and He loves you and cares about you. One of the things I'll share about God tomorrow is this is one of His first characteristics, full of compassion, a deep, tender care for people. He loves you deeply. He knows you've been in pain. He knows what's happened, the struggles at your work, the struggles in your personal life. 
the difficulties you're carrying because there's been so much criticism. He knows all of those things. He wants you to know he believes in you, son. He believes in you. God believes in you. He says you're very gifted, you're very talented, but you struggle because what happened in your family. You struggle because you've been trying to make life go without anyone to help you. He understands your pain. He loves you deeply. This is our God. He knows the secrets of our hearts. He knows what's happening. I want you just to close your eyes and we're all going to pray a prayer together. It's called the sinner's prayer. It's a prayer to open our heart to the love of God and to receive his forgiveness and receive his spirit into our heart. I want you to, as you listen to the prayer and then pray it, put meaning into the words. It's your prayer. And God hears your prayer. And if it comes from a heart that's sincere, his spirit floods your heart, forgives your sin, and he comes to you, you become a home for him. And he will never, never, never leave you. Church, let's pray this prayer together. Let's help everyone. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, I come to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for accepting me. Lord, today I'm a sinner. Lord, today I'm a sinner. Living independently. Living independently. But I turn to you. But I turn to you. Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, I receive you. I ask you to forgive all of my sins. I receive your spirit into my heart. I receive your spirit into my heart. I receive the spirit of sonship. I give you my life today. I give you my life today. To follow you. To follow you. To be led by your spirit. To be led by your spirit. And today I declare. And today I declare. Before heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. Jesus Christ is my Savior. And I have Lord. become a child of God. I have become a child of God. God is my Father. God is my Father. And He will never leave me. And He will never leave me. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Let's give them a clap. How wonderful. I got to come down. I can't stay that far away from everyone. There we go. You've got to come down and say hello. God bless. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to God's family. God bless you. God loves you. God bless you, son. Hey, God bless you. Wow, so many wonderful people coming into the kingdom of God. God bless you. Father, touch her. Father, heal the grief she carries. Touch her with your presence right now. Amen. God bless you, son. God bless you. Well, here's your pastor. Welcome him into the family of God. God bless. What do they have a program now? They have someone take them in front. Okay, you explain to them. One more time. Can we give our new friends? Our family, new family members, a big, big hand. Amen, amen, amen. It's so wonderful. So wonderful. All of us have done that before. For some of us, it has been a long time ago. But it never gets old, isn't it? To be accepted, loved by God, to have the revelation that we are not often. It's so wonderful. And I can see from the eyes of these people that God is touching them wherever you are standing. I know that this message has blessed you. It is so important to be reminded again that God did not place us on this earth to struggle alone. Jesus has given us the best gift that he can give. Besides being crucified on that cross and won the victory, he has given us the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit of the Father abide within us forever till we meet again. Isn't that wonderful? And all that He has assigned us to do, and all that we desire to do, all that we are wired to do, He will enable us to do it because the Spirit of the Father lives in us. So let's leave this place 
with our head held high, our joy, our, our heart full of joy, our belly just spring out the fountain of life, knowing that we are made in the image of God and according to His likeness. We are not just any ordinary lost person that's walking on this face of the earth and trying to figure out how to live our life. Our Father has demanded for us. Our Father has given us everything that we need. Our Father is with us. His Spirit is forever connected to us till Jesus come back and take us home one day. So give all the glory to the Father. Give all the glory to Jesus. Give all the glory to the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of God. Let's praise Him and worship Him. A shout of joy, a shout of victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, God reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Oh, hallelujah, our God reigns forever. first time the Spirit of God is also knocking at the door of many of our hearts tonight we have heard the Word of God and we identify with the message because so many of us are still not doing it right we turn to passion possession and many other things I love what I heard tonight what we own is not who we are. We are the sons and the daughters of God. Yes, the breakthrough will come. Yes, His blessings will overtake us. But we have the favor of the Father upon us because we are His sons and his daughters and he loves us tremendously so wherever you are standing tonight and you know that there are some areas of your life that you need to surrender that you need to make adjustment let this be the beginning of it all like what pastor Ari say this is the first week of the next half of the year let's do it right Let's make an agreement with God. Let's make a decision in our heart that our life will be transformed. The way we live from today onwards will be different because the revelation of God has set our mind and our emotion free in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want to encourage you, don't let this church service be another service, another sermon, good sermon that you have heard and when you go home and you live just like the word, just the same like yesterday, be different, 
live different, be transformed. Father, I thank you for the word of God that you have given to us. I thank you for your love. I thank you, God, for the revelation and how, God, when, I, when we open up our hearts to receive your revelation, how we can be so empowered and set free that truly we will not walk or feel or live the same. And this world will not be the same because of you and your people. So we thank you. We love you. We thank you for the word of God that put faith in our hearts. In Jesus' name and all God's people say, let's give Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit one more big hand. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor, for ministering to us. We look forward for tomorrow's message. Amen. Those of you that know that you are free tomorrow morning, please know that you are most welcome to get crash. Yeah. All right? To the morning service. And for those of you that responded to Jesus, we are so happy. Some of you are the first time in our church. Please let this not be the only time. We welcome you back again and again in church. Let them know. We are so happy that you are here and we want you back every week. Thank you for being part of us. Thank you. And standing beside you, there is a counselor that would like to talk to you a little bit about God. Counselors, you can go ahead and minister to them and just talk to them. So the musicians will continue to play, but church, the service has ended. The fellowship has just begun. But if you can help me not to sing those happy birthday songs just for a while, all right, so that our friends in the in the, um, in the front can have their moment with the counselors. Thank you so much. Have a blessed weekend. Amen.